The conversation today is really going to center around how to talk to kids about race. Um, and as a way of introduction, my name is Mona Kafisha, and I am the director of grants and contracts for the Association for Supportive Child Care. Um, and what I would like to do is to just take a minute to have um, the panel members take a second to introduce themselves so everybody knows who you are. And we have a couple of discussion questions. The intent of this conversation is to be um, really open-ended and give everybody a chance to kind of reflect together on how to talk to kids about race. So for introductions, let's start with Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay Olivares. I'm the uh, chair of the board of directors for the Association for Supportive Child Care. I'm a mom of two girls. I have a seven-year-old and a two-year-old. I am also an adjunct instructor here at a community college in the Valley um, and a contributor for East Valley Moms Blog. Um, I am coming to this from the perspective of a mom of uh, two kids who are part um, Latino, Latina heritage. Um, and also my family is predominantly Eastern European and Jewish heritage. Um, I grew up in a very small town where different was not uh, typical. <laughs> so that sort of shaped how um, uh, I now you know, live in a much more metropolitan area and um, see all kinds of things um, and engage with all sorts of different people and really try to um, make sure that my, my kids are um, engaged citizens and kind citizens and um, are aware of racial issues and armed with how to, um, how to handle them. Great, thank you, Lindsay. We're so excited to have you here. Jorge, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Sure, my name is Jorge Flores and I'm a professional developer, uh, development trainer and developer uh, here at Association for Supported Childcare. And today I'm gonna be talking to you guys as, as a father, as a father of five children, um, Mexican American children. They are bilingual and they live in a border area. So I hope that I can share some of those tips, some of our errors, some of our success with you guys today. Thank you, Jorge. We really appreciate you having here. And I think your perspective living in Yuma and a border community is gonna really add a lot of value to the conversation too. Dawn, do you wanna introduce yourself next? Sure. Um, I'm Dawn Henry. I am the Human Resources Director at the Association for Supportive Child Care. Um, I am also a single mom of three incredible young men who are now 19, 24, and 29. Um, I, too, grew up kind of in the suburbs of Chicago, um, moved to Arizona when I was in grade school, and um, have lived in the East Valley, raised my children in the East Valley um, their entire lives. Um, so as a single mom, um, you know, haven't had, didn't, growing up, didn't have a whole lot of exposure to folks of other race, from other races. Um, so really raising my boys um, to help them to understand who they are and where they've come from um, and how to navigate through some of the, the challenges of racism um, really has been a journey for us, I think. And I hope I can share some some of our experiences with you and, and help you navigate things for your own children. And Don, we're so excited to have you here. And I think your perspective is going to be so helpful to hear because your sons are older and you've had, you know, early childhood baby all the way through teenagers and young adults now to kind of have those conversations with them. And I think that <clears throat> that perspective is going to be really helpful for people listening. Aliyah, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Aliyah Samuel. I live in Northern Virginia. I am a former Arizona resident. I actually been, lived in Arizona for six years, which is where I actually met several of the panelists during my tenure. I am originally from the country of Panama and I am very much a Hispanic Latina female. However, I also present myself very much as a black woman. Uh, I am, uh, my husband is from rural Alabama. So we certainly have two varying perspectives of what it means to be black and in America. Uh, we have two young sons, a first grader and a fourth grader. And uh, it's been an interesting journey for us trying to find that balance of how to protect our sons and their rightful innocence as children, but also recognizing that we're raising two black boys during uh, an ongoing era um, where they aren't necessarily safe or seen as children. And so it's been an interesting journey for us as parents 
Um, and I am also an educator or an edu and in education policy. I was a former teacher, assistant principal and principal, and then moved into the education policy space. So um, it's been an interesting balance of trying to address these topics as an, in as an educator and someone in the policy world, but also a parent who's living it every day as well. Thank you, Aaliyah. And I think that dynamic is going to really add a lot to this conversation of both the professional capacity and experiences, but also raising young boys yourself and, and what that's looked like as a parent, both in Arizona and then now in Virginia and the differences between the states and the parts of the country. Perfect. Thank you. And then final introduction, Candida. Uh, good morning. Hello, everyone. My name is Candida Hunter. I am Wallapai and Mexican, so I grew up in Northwest Arizona. Um, I am the, a mother of a 14-year-old daughter, but I also received a permanent guardianship of my nephews last year, and they are 14, soon to be 13, and a four-year-old. So I'm really, you know, honored to be a part of this conversation. And um, I'm just today I'm joining you from, like I said, uh, Kingman, Arizona. I think I mentioned that, which is on the indige indigenous homelands of the Wallapai people. So um, I think this is a really interesting conversation and one that I, um, it's, it's hard, I don't come to in this type of space, I think, enough. So I'm really um, looking forward to hearing from everyone and, you know, learning and sharing. We're really excited to have you here, Candida. And again, I think another diverse perspective of not only parenting your own child, but also being a permanent guardian for your nephews too. I think what an amazing experience that's been. And that kind of adds to that richness of your own experience of um, parenting them as indigenous children. Um, so the way that we're gonna have the conversation work is that we have a couple of discussion questions that I'm gonna um, ask. And if you have something to contribute, please, feel free to jump in. Um, if not, that's okay, we'll move on to the next question. But um, I think the first one really kind of sets the tone for what we're hoping to have happen in this conversation. Um, and that's your earliest memory of becoming aware of racism. So um, either as a child or as an adult, um, if you can reflect back on that first awareness or one of those first awareness that racism exists and that people are treated unfairly based, based on the nature of their race or the way that they look. Um, I think that really will help us kind of set the tone for what children's experiences are as they go through life and see some of those as well. So anybody who wants to start, please feel free to jump in. I'm happy to start, Mona. Um, my, you know, my journey was interesting. My parents, um, my mother moved to the States uh, and when I was in early elementary school, uh, second grade to be exact, and we moved from the country of Panama where we were living at the time to Olympia, Washington. Well, really it was Fort Lewis where my parents were stationed in the military. And I'll never forget my first day of elementary school. And, you know, as a principal, now I understand the practice, you know, typically you go into a classroom to verify your first day of school counts. And I can remember the principal coming in and they were talking to the teacher and they had a piece of paper and they were counting how many girls, how many boys, and how many black, how many white. And I remember, and my husband just set the fire alarm off in the house. So I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> He's cooking dinner. It's East Coast time, but I'll keep going. Hopefully it won't be too much of a distraction. Um, and I remember the principal looking at, our, at my teacher, Mrs. Morgan, who I'll never forget. And he said, you know, um, she's black. And my teacher responded to him and I'm sitting in the front row and she says, well, she speaks Spanish, so I'm not sure what she is. And I remember this dialogue between the principal and the teacher trying to figure out which box to put me in. And I remember going home and asking my mom, like, what do they mean I'm black? Because I had come from a community where lots of people look like me, lots of people spoke Spanish. So I wasn't an anomaly and I didn't understand that. And that is really where I began to understand from a very early age, although my home community operated in one way, the world would see me in a different way. And it caused quite a bit of an identity crisis. I mean, I didn't even start speaking Spanish again until I hit my mid twenties because I had experience after experience after experience of how can you be black and speak Spanish? Like, <laughs> what, what is that? And it created a, a sensitivity. And so I opted to not speak Spanish publicly and just really present myself as a black woman. 
And it wasn't until, like I said, I was in my mid twenties and started to really have an appreciation for the biculturalism that I owned it and have accepted it. And really it has um, uh, been a cornerstone of how I parent my boys so that they understand that they can be both. They don't have to be one box or another. Thank you for sharing. I think that's such a powerful story to reflect on. And I mean, not only the complexities of walking that line and, you know, figuring out which box to check for lack of a better term, but um, for adults having that conversation in front of you in the classroom too, feels a little uncomfortable that there you weren't included in that conversation, even as a child to ask you about what felt most comfortable or what they thought you should check or what your family might say. I think that's a, that's a really interesting reflection. Thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else want to talk about their earliest ex- earliest memory of becoming aware of racism? Lindsay, I see you nodding. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a very um, white suburb of Chicago. So Chicago in and of itself, of course, is a very diverse, really interesting, complex community. My little town wasn't. <laughs> it was a very small town, very rural, um, very, um, you know, the horse set. <laughs> people who own horses. Um, And my school was, um, you know, relatively large for the size of our town. But I can remember um, very vividly that there were very few kids of color, um, particularly black kids. They're just there. They just weren't there. Um, I can recall um, two or three in my grade um, by the time I hit junior high and they were cousins. So it was, I mean, it was just a dearth of, of um, um, diversity. Now, I do remember um, we had a bordering community that bust kids into our schools. And um, there, were, there was much more diversity in those populations of kids coming in. And I remember when um, there would be any kind of... Um, behavior issues or, you know, any issues with grasping the, the lessons that were being taught, it was almost like, a well, that's just, that's those kids. And I, I remember seeing that in elementary school through junior high, and then I moved to Arizona um, just before high school. Um, but it, it was just such a tacit, okay thing to be dismissive of kids of color, um, the few that we had. Um, And there just was no interaction. Those kids played with those kids. These kids played with these kids. There was no intermingling. Um, And that's not that long ago. I mean, I'm in my, I'm in my late thirties. It was not that long ago and it felt very, um, segregated for lack of a better term, um, even if it was just socially segregated. Um, but that, that was, um, that's a memory I think I'll always carry with me that that was, even though it wasn't necessarily happening to me. Um, but I, I just, I will never forget some of their names. I'll never forget some of the things that were said. I mean, it, and again, it was just a tacit, um, this is apparently okay to be so dismissive and so derogatory about kids in front of them and, and really place the blame on um, their heritage as opposed to something else that might be going on. So it, it was just a very interesting experience recognizing it as a kid and now looking back as an adult and a parent going, oh my God, how was this? How was this okay? Why was this happening? So. Thank you for sharing, Lindsay. I think another really powerful story of um, experiencing that being kind of pushed onto other kids and kind of deflected onto other kids. And I, I think that the language you talked about the school personnel using, like those kids, really, I imagine, is echoed amongst people who've experienced racism as, as a young child or have um, seen racism perpetrated on other children as a young child, this kind of like um, separation or xenophobia of being different or Um, other and using labels like other or those or you know to kind of create that separation that um, is needed to be able to perpetrate the stereotype of there being racism and that needs to happen. Thank you for sharing. Does anybody else want to respond to this question? Jorge. Yes so my first memories of uh, experiencing racism I think they actually come from my own family. You know, growing up in Mexico, um, there are a lot of 
people that discriminate people for different reasons. One of them, it's because of class. And we experienced that in our own family. My dad was from a different class than my mom and different background. And I remember how they used to make fun of her origin and, you know, the things that they will say to me to influence me not to go to certain places or to go to her hometown. And it wasn't only that. I think, you know, I also remember the fact that, you know, being light complected in comparison to someone that was darker complected, it was a big issue for some of the members of my family, which shouldn't happen at all. And then, of course, you know, even as a child, I think you can still recognize certain differences in regards to the expectations that people have for uh, the gender, males and females. And I think we left all of that, not to mention, you know, we had a really bad culture track when we got here to the United States. And the fact that, you know, like Aliyah mentioned, you know, a lot of the times you feel ashamed, the fact that you that you speak Spanish because of the way that you are treated. And, you know, there's a lot of people they choose not to teach their children Spanish because of those reasons, because of the experiences that they had as they were growing up. And in my particular case, I decided to do the opposite. I decided to give my children a really good base in Spanish. And we've been criticized for it. Now in school, sometimes, you know, the, the, the people tell me, so you're an educator. So, you know, how come your child doesn't speak English? How come he's not a uh, profession? And I tell them, you know what? It's my choice. It's my choice to give my child a really good base on their native language. And believe me, they will be okay with the English that will have a lot of different ways to make connections. That is such an important point to make, Jorge. And I think the more we learn about how better prepared kids are when they're dual language learners, when they speak two languages as a young child and how that prepares them for school success and life success and social emotional health and all the things that go along with that and the, the sense of belonging to their community and their family, I think the more we learn about that, the more there shouldn't be an excuse that people are upset that children speak one language or another and that we should be inclusive and excited about kids speaking more than one language. And I applaud that you're doing that with your children because I think to take that stand as a you know, relatively new immigrant to the United States that is you know, preparing your children to be United States citizens that also speak Spanish and English, I think is such, a, a, such an important step to, to take and is really kind of preparing them for um, success and to really be able to um, represent and integrate into their culture really effectively. Thank you for sharing that. So let's move on to the second. Oh, Candida, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, yeah I just wanted to share. So um, when I think back on my experiences is I really wanted to just share two is uh, the first one is that I mentioned I'm Wallapine Mexican. So I grew up on the reservation and my skin is lighter than a lot of my um, kids I was went, went to school with. Um, and so I used to be called like a wetback, a Mexican American, um, because and my skin, but the other thing was half breed, um, half breed because I was only half <laughs> Wallapai. And so when we think about um, race too, is that I think there's also within different tribal communities is that, you know, half blood or full blood, which is really just based off of colonization. So I think that that, you know, um, I didn't understand it. My parents were just like, you're Wallapai and Mexican. Um, you know, the, the sooner you accept it, the easier life will be. But we didn't talk about race. Like I didn't process it to rec realize that it's based off of different races. Um, the other thing is um, I remember that, um, and I actually, Jorge gave me the, um, I guess, courage to share this because if we don't share it, it won't change is that within my own family, um, I have a, a cousin um, who's black. And I remember my grandpa saying very negative things, calling him negative things. And, you know, with that, my parents were like, you know, it's not right. But we didn't, they didn't say it's because of his skin. And so I think like that was something that I had to process too, um, you know, from a young age. 
Yeah, that's a really, really important point um, that I think it's, it's one thing to be disparaging when someone makes a racist comment. And it's another thing with children to be really specific about why it's not appropriate and to just say it's not right. I don't know that that prepares kids to understand that that's coming from a place of racism versus maybe an adult disagreeing with something that's being said. I think your point is so important that um, if there was a level of specificity there, it kind of prepares people to be ready to understand where that comment comes from or that perspective, perspective comes from. That's a really, really great point. And I, I appreciate you sharing the perspective of um, the way that tribes look at people who are not necessarily um, full-blooded of the tribe that they are a part of and, and how that can have ramifications on families and children too um, for that kind of challenge or strife that kids might come up against because they aren't necessarily um, fully integrated into the tribe in the way maybe other children are. Thank you for sharing. So we'll move on to the second question if you guys are ready. Um, and I'm curious what feelings, thoughts, and reflections you're holding right in this moment. And I think we're in such a unique moment uh, because the inauguration was yesterday. Um, and we have had the last 12, 10 months of really kind of intense, intense action and reaction and behavior and conversation around um, race and what that looks like and racism and kind of national policy around that and, and policing of racism and what that looks like. Um, so I'm curious how you're feeling and kind of what you're holding on to right now um, from your own perspective, from your family's perspective, and then from your community's perspective. Just what are you thinking and feeling? I feel like to some degree I'm walking a tightrope. Um, it's, you know, historically we have tried to make um, race an open discussion, nothing that was, you know, um, frowned upon in terms of having the conversation. But to be completely honest, it never occurred to either me or my husband to um, proactively educate our girls about it. Um, because it just wasn't, in my mind, it wasn't an, an issue. And I know that that's, a, that's privilege speaking that way. Um, and I recognize that. Um, but, you know, I saw my seven-year-old have, you know, her, her, she's one of a little group of four in her, in her class, in her um, school that they've been friends since kindergarten. And they have someone who's Southern Indian. There's her, she's, you know, half, or she's part uh, Latina. Um, she has another friend who's half Latina and another friend who is um, half black. And that's their little square of kids. I'm going, oh, my, my kid is so great. These are her friends. <laughs> it never really occurred to me that I needed to do more. She's the nice kid. She's nice to everybody. It's okay. And then, um, of course, the summer happened and it really changed how I thought about it. And I think it changed how most people thought about it in terms of you can't just passively let it happen and then react to it. You need to have the conversation proactively. Um, so of course I invested in books and, and um, different resources to try and plant those seeds and discuss it. Um, but I feel like I'm also on a tightrope because um, there's this, I think, pitted against the work of anti-racism is if you want to, to be and create anti-racist advocates in your family, you must somehow think that you're not proud of being a US citizen. You're not grateful for first responders. You're not, you know, you're somehow um, condemning those people as you are trying to uplift these people. Um, and that's, that's a tough balance for me, if I'm being really honest about it. Um, I have first responder um, friends and, and I, it's difficult because I know they feel very demonized by what's happened. Um, and I think a lot of um, the um, systems that led us to this place are worthy of demonizing. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of work to be done to fix that. Um, but it, it definitely feels like a balancing act. How am I going to teach my daughter? Um, go to a police officer if you're in trouble at a park. Find the helpers. Um, but meanwhile, I have this feeling of, gosh, I'm so lucky I can say that to my daughter because she doesn't have to worry about 
what she looks like to that police officer. Um, and that's, that's hard. That's a very emotional, um, feeling for me to be honest about it. So Mona, if I could jump in, I actually live about a half hour, um, from DC where, um, the events on the Capitol January 6th occurred. And I am also in the policy space. So I've been very fortunate to work with amazing leaders on both sides of the aisle, from governors, from legislators to you name it. And there are phenomenal Republican leaders. There are phenomenal Democrat leaders. And what we are seeing as a nation from my perspective has nothing to do with party. It has to do with hate and racism. And as a person of color, this inauguration, these last two weeks living so close to, to a degree, the epicenter of what's happening has created very mixed emotions. Um, thinking about how to, in the DMV area, inauguration is a day off federal government, everything shuts down. How to talk to my boys about the significance of this moment and not because of party, not because it's a Democrat in the office, not because it's a Republican in the office, because in our nation's history, there has never been a mixed race person. And there's, there was one Native American man, I believe that was vice president like 20 years ago or something like that. I, I, it's outside of my, my recollection right now. But just from a data perspective of what it means to have somebody who is non-white in this role and particularly a woman, because they see their mom working, they understand mommy has a big job, but to see it and what that meant, but then also absolutely having fear in my heart for my brother who is a black male who lives a block two blocks at most from the Capitol and having to worry about his safety, not because he's breaking the law, not because he's done anything wrong, but because of the color of his skin. My oldest son had some kind of crazy allergic reaction to something and my husband wanted to go to the CVS that's eight minutes away from our house at most to get Benadryl at 10 o'clock at night. And the visceral reaction of fear that I had because my big black husband who lives in a predominantly white neighborhood, what would happen? Will he make it back home? And there is a sense of privilege that I don't have. And I think it's important to underscore that race and class, it's absolutely an issue. But in some cases, race and class don't matter because as a black woman who's middle-class, well-educated, lives a good life, it doesn't protect me or my husband or our kids from racially charged events and circumstances. And that is a reality that we as a nation have to grapple with and get past the point of trying to disguise it as a party issue. Try to get past disguising it as an income or class issue when fundamentally at the core of it, it's race. That is the issue. And it's not an issue for all, but it, race and racism is an issue for some. And it is a weed that needs to be plucked because at the end of the day, we all cry, we all laugh, we all love, we are all mothers, we are all fathers, sisters, cousins, like all the emotions and right you, you feel for your own, we also feel. So it's time to get to a point where humanism becomes more important, this is my opinion, than race and class. And I think you touched on a really important point there is um, that I think uh, children and especially men of color will experience racism in a real way that people that aren't of color aren't able to understand or um, haven't lived through in that same way. But I think that although the effects of racism are really localized to people who are experiencing it um, on a receiving end, it's important that racism affects non-people of color as well, because if there isn't movement in those white families to have conversations with white children and change policy in white spaces, it doesn't 
support anybody in making any kind of difference. And the acknowledgement and recognition that racism is a real part of the way that the country operates, I think is such an important thing to kind of come back to. And um, the dynamic, and when Lindsay talked about the tightrope, the dynamic in DC of having this um, joyous occasion with a woman, woman of color being VP, but then the thousands and thousands of National Guard officers that needed to be in DC to keep the peace, right? And we want to celebrate the really exciting pieces of that. But then on the flip side, there's this like requirement to have this military presence to kind of keep everything smooth and running the way that it should. And I think there's there's difficulties and necessities that go along with that too. Mona, um, I was going to just um, piggyback on what Aaliyah said. Um, you know, I have, I'm a, I'm a bundle of thoughts and feelings, I think. Um, I'm frustrated because of the racism that does happen in our communities and the experiences that our kids and families as a whole have um, every single day. Um, I am hopeful. Um, events like this make me hopeful that we're having conversations, that we're educating each other, that we are taking the time to kind of hold up the mirror and do some self-reflection on our own personal beliefs, our upbringing, what we know. Um, I'm hopeful that, you know, someday, hopefully, my young men who, like I said, are much older, um, but yet, like Aaliyah said, when they go out, I still have to have conversation with them, right? I still worry about where they're at, what they're doing. Um, our children shouldn't have to be warned when they're young that they have to be better than everybody else or else they'll be singled out. Um, parents should not have to go to the schools and advocate for sped services for their child because, well, you know, that's just how they are. Um, you know, it should be equal. All children should receive the same benefits. I shouldn't have to worry that if my son, heaven forbid, were to get pulled over, that he would be not treated the same way my mother, who's 70, would. You know, um, it's, it's really, um, these are incredibly important conversations for us to have. Um, and Aaliyah, like you said, it's humanism. It's, we need to be human, we need to be kind, um, and we need to really take a deep dive and look at, at who we are and what messages we are putting out there, um, you know, to our kids, to others in the community, um, and standing up when we, when we do see injustice happening for others. All good points, Don, and, and I think that the comment you made about worrying about your son's safety, even as, you know, adults and Aaliyah, your husband as an adult, this isn't just kids, right? And it's not just how children are treated by teachers or children's experience in school that uh, it persists even through adulthood and, and that worry over safety or being pulled over or minor infractions that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be as damaging for someone if they weren't of color, I think is a really important piece to kind of pull up on. And um, I wanna transition into Mona, this. really quick, of course. I just wanna add on to that. I think it's important to underscore that the impacts of racism aren't just in that moment and a fear for your safety. It is physiological, it is emotional. Like there are layers to the impact of racism and having these experiences on racism. You know, when I, every time my husband leaves and I start to feel the anxiety, that is taking a toll on my physical well being. That is taking a toll on my emotional, my spiritual well being. And there are families, there are people across races who are dealing with this every day. And it's not just the adults that feel the physiological effects. It's children as well, because they can sense the stress and anxiety in their parents. They can sense that, wait a minute, something's not right. I may not be able to articulate it. And so we have to deal with the trauma that comes with um, these, ex these, these experiences around race because they are um, deep and they are also intergenerational. Like, I, you know, I, I think about how cautious we have to be with talking th with these things with our sons because they're at an age where it is going to leave an impression on them 
and what that impression is, I don't know. I won't know until they, at, they get older. And so there is really a need to call out that it's not just about, oh, well, we just want to you know, dismiss or, or deal with the surface level issues of racism. We have to deal with the undercurrent of what it does to people and communities as well. We've had generations and generations and generations that are, have carried this mental health and emotional health weight, you know, and I think that that there's so much to be said for that, that it isn't just a single experience or a single person or a single instance of racism, that this is really kind of carrying on and snowballing, I guess, for lack of a better term, into something that takes a real physical and emotional toll on adults and then the children that they're caring for and that they're in their lives. It's an excellent point. Um, the next question is very related to what we've been talking about. I think a couple of you have, have touched on it. Um, and so I'm curious how you've talked about racism with your own children. Um, and if you have had that conversation or have been forced to have that conversation, I should be more clear because I'm sure a lot of it is needing to have that conversation to keep kids safe and aware. Um, so if you've had to have that conversation, how did you approach it with your children? Um, and if you haven't had that conversation, do you have a plan for discussing it? And I imagine that um, the events this summer kind of forced a lot of families to reflect on racism with their children because it was in the news and kids were talking about it. But um, if that hasn't been a part of the conversation you've had with your children or they're very young, do you have thoughts or a plan in place to be proactive about having conversations about racism with your children? Uh, I, sorry, I, I can be brief. I can just tell you with my boys being much older and me coming, being, you know, raised in a prim primarily white um, community, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so literally it was rolling the dice and it, the conversations that I had with my boys typically stemmed from incidents or events that we encountered, you know, um, the assumptions that because they were, you know, look different than I did, they were adopted. Well, how do you explain that to your kids? Nope, they're mine. I had them, you know, um, things like being overlooked by teachers, those kinds of things. Um, it was in the moment type conversations that I had to have. I wish I knew more when they were growing up, but I, I just didn't. Um, I just didn't. Best we can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think that's a benefit about having conversations like this is that um, if you if you haven't thought through what that conversation could look like or what would be um, the way to approach that conversation, now here's an opportunity to kind of think about it and how have other people done it. And I think the openness and willingness to talk about it in this really public forum really makes a difference where, you know, your boys are older, so you kind of had to wing it and do the best job that you possibly could, which was fantastic and exactly what they needed. But we're prepared now to be a little bit more intentional about those conversations. Candida. Yeah, I think um, so. I actually was, um, I'll say, forced to have the conversation. I have a, like I mentioned, my daughter is uh, 14, but we um, had moved to Phoenix um, 2014. So she was eight years old. And um, that was, and it was the first time that she experienced being different. Um, and kids didn't say, you know, well, some kids said, oh, you're Indian. Um, so she was like, well, I'm Wallapai, Navajo, and Mexican. So and, and I, for me, it was like, I never talked about, you know, whites, blacks, Latinos. I never, I never did. It was just because in our space, we were on the reservation. Everyone looked like her. No one singled her out. So I didn't feel that there was a need to have that conversation. Um, but when we moved to the city, I definitely had to have that conversation. So I think for me, it was really, I should have took the opportunity to really think through that. And I'm doing that with my younger nephew, um, reading books that show diversity um, um, and he has a diverse classroom, our um, child care center. So I think that that's a good thing. Um, one of the things too, I think is being okay with being uncomfortable. Um, and I think about that because I remember when I was trying to access services um, for my nephews and the question th that came up was, oh, they're from the reservation. Well, how are they going to make their appointments? I'm here to access services for them. So what concern is that of yours? <laughs> it should show my commitment but because I'm from the reservation or they're from the reservation, you automatically assume that we are not going to be here. So I think it was really um, with that. I mean, I, it was in the moment I was 
frustrated <laughs> with having challenges and trying to having all these questions, first of all, being told to come back to do an intake. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, is this how you treat families? And do you treat families of color differently? I mean, what does that look like? So I think for me it was um, after, you know, I don't know if this is the right thing to do or not, but it felt like the right thing was to um, ask my nephews to step out while I had a conversation um, with the supervisor. And then afterwards talking to them about that, like, you know, it's not right to be treated like that. Um, you know, these are some of the situations that happen. Um, you know, we're from the res, this is why we're being, it's being questioned, but to really, you know, stand up for yourself. I think one thing that both, um, I think Don and Aliyah had mentioned earlier was kind of about, Oh, and it was Linda, Lindsay, that fine line is that I want my, especially I think about the kids is I want them to be outgoing. I want them to go and do things. But at the same time, it also makes me a little nervous because will they push a line? Um, and who is it that they'll be, be, you know, will it be a teacher? Will it be an adult, a coach? Who is it that, that they'll be interacting with? Um, so I think that that's also, you know, a fine line to navigate. And I, I think the way that you described how you handle that situation is perfect, you know, because it's it's not always the appropriate space to have those conversations with children in the room, but to debrief with them afterwards and say, here's what happened. Here's why it was not the right thing. Here's why it shouldn't have happened this way. I think you're you're including them in that situation, in that conversation, but not in a place where there could potentially be a combative situation with another adult that kind of would take away a lot of that learning opportunity from them. Thank you for sharing that, Candy. Mona, I think it's also important to underscore, you know, as we have, as we communities of color have to have these conversations with our children. And for those of you who have the privilege to say, oh my gosh, that's just terrible. I can't imagine having to talk to my six-year-old, my four-year-old, my 14-year-old, my 29-year-old about these issues with race, that is a privilege. And for me, the reason why I come to these conversations, because it is exhausting. I have to live this every day. It is not something that I can opt in and out of. The reason why I have these conversations, the reason why I'm on this at eight o'clock at night Eastern time is because my hope is the same courage I have to have as a parent to have these conversations with my son. I hope it creates a sense of courage in those non-communities of color homes so that you can have conversations with your children so that we get to a point where we don't have to have these conversations, where our kids or our grandkids, my grandkids, your grandkids can grow up in a world where I don't have to have the talk with my boys about what it means to be a man of color, where I don't have to worry about my husband and his safety, not because he is, because he's anything else but a black man in America. Like, my, that is my hope in these conversations. And as difficult as it is, we're all on a journey. I mean, I'm on a journey with this with my own boys. I'm on this, own, um, this journey with myself as a woman of color. And how much do I share about my private life in a professional or public forum? But if my story can touch a heart to say, gosh, not only is this not right, but I'm willing to talk to my non-children of color about what families of color are going through so they don't grow up to do some of the things that we're talking about, then it's well worth it. And I, I think that's a great transition to me offering my thanks for everybody to be willing to have those conversations with their children in their communities as part of this conversation, because it's, I can't, I can't put myself in those shoes and to imagine um, the emotional weight that carries to raise children and need to have those conversations and navigate the world and need to have those conversations. I just am eternally grateful that you all have been willing and interested to have these conversations and to really help prepare everybody to do better and be better. And I wanna be cognizant of time because I know it's very late for Aaliyah. Um, and we do have one more question that I'm hoping we can touch on really quickly for anybody that wants to respond to it. And then we can do some closing and see if there's any questions from the listeners. Um, so the final question is, um, there's been a focus on being um, anti-racist versus not racist recently. And I think a lot of the conversations have stemmed from um, George Floyd this summer and some of the um, uh, 
conversations about uh, police reactions to people of color and things like that. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on a step that families might be able to take to ensure their kids grow up being anti-racist versus not racist. Are there things that you have done with your own families that support anti-racism or are there things that you wish um, families that are not of color would are doing with their children to support this focus and language is important. So when we think about not racist and anti-racist, they are very different things. And so is there a perspective or an action that you've taken or that you hope families are taking to support their children in growing up with a disposition of being anti-racist? I think it's important for families, for parents to realize the children are noticing people that are different, you know, and they need to be prepared for that. You know, young children, even at three, six months old, they're able to see the difference between their primary caregivers and some of the people they might approach them. So we need to let them understand that it's okay to notice color, that it's okay to notice race and talk about it in a responsible way. You know, things like uh, what Candida said, you know, reading books to children, even sitting down with them and watching their favorite shows, you will get into situations where you, they're gonna notice differences. And it's important for you to talk to them about them and tell them how important is diversity and how has enriched our communities and our countries in all senses, you know, music, art, food, knowledge, leadership, so many things that diversity brings into the table. And I think it's also important for us to put our, our kids in those type of situations, you know, travel, uh, talk about your culture, learning about other cultures, but everything needs to be done in a responsible way. And whenever you don't know something, let them know you, you don't know it and research. And that opens a, a, a new opportunity for you to do the research with them. And learn together, right? I think Jorge, you make such an important, important, important point that, um, you know, coming from my own perspective as a professional educator, as a um, coming from a family that's multi-ethnic and then as a human being, this idea of colorblindness has always been very uncomfortable. And I think it's that, um, pretending that it's not okay to talk about race and to talk about this person looks different or this person eats different food or this person celebrates a different holiday and um, turning that around and making it into an opportunity to research and learn with children really makes the, a big difference, but also sets them up that that is now their norm when there's something that, that's new or different that someone does or says, as opposed to just this visceral reaction of it's other and makes me uncomfortable to really pause acknowledge that it's different from their own experience and then kind of do that research on their own. I think you're, you're building important skills in your children when your own behavior reflects this openness to discuss and this openness to research. Thank you for sharing that. If I can, I, I wanted to dovetail off of what Jorge said. It's such, while this is a very disappointing and disheartening time, it's also a time that we're finally coming to the table and talking brass tacks about what's going on. And there are now resources that did not exist when my generation was growing up. Um, so we have people of color who are in cartoons. We have people with disabilities who are on Sesame Street. We have books that directly hit at racism. Um, and what that means. And there are so many resources available now that can start this conversation because this isn't, this is, 
not a one and done kind of a thing. This is something that is ongoing and will look different depending on the ages of your kids, what's going on in the world. Um, my family loves food. We've always been a cultural, you know, we've, we've loved dipping into different cultures through their food. Um, there's a multicultural festival that happens in Chandler every year that we've taken our girls to. We love to see the different dancing, the different singing, the different artistry. It's wonderful. And those are just things in your backyard. Um, you know, we, our next door neighbor celebrates Diwali. So that was a wonderful opportunity for our seven-year-old to learn a little about, about Diwali. Um, and really the way that I try to address things with her is when we encounter a situation other than the books that I read with her and other than the conversations that we start a little bit inorganically, organically, the best way that I have found to address it, at least with my, my kiddos is if we run into a situation of difference, of otherness, whatever that difference or otherness is, we engage through whatever the event is. And then when we're in that safe place of home, like Candida was saying in terms of having the conversation with the supervisor out of the earshot of her nephews, what did you think about that? How did you feel about that? What did you notice about that interaction? Do you have questions? Do you know why that person was in a wheelchair? Do you understand what that speech impediment issue may have been? Those are all the kinds of questions that I try to ask my seven-year-old. And she's a very inquisitive kiddo. Kids by nature are. So they will help you out. So you don't need to feel like you're talking to fill up space with them. They want to know. They want to have those conversations with you. Why is that kiddo different looking? You know, what is that? Um, and just being honest and open. And like Jorge says, if you don't know something, do the research. It's a really interesting way of, of educating yourself and showing education is allyship and education is advocacy. So if you can show that you, that you're doing something about it, instead of just being idle, that's teaching your kids a valuable lesson in and of itself. Um, I tried to put together, you know, like I mentioned, I'm a contributor for a local um, mom blog, and we just ran a series of different books and um, educators and influencers and um, visual media that can help start these conversations. Um, I'm on Instagram and you can find me on Instagram and there's a link in my bio for that. And I think we're going to be sharing that kind of information is my understanding. Um, and I would just encourage anyone to, to take a dip. And that really is just a toe in the water. There are so many more that I've learned about, even just since those have been published, but take advantage of, of the time we're in now, which is um, a much more educated space, or at least a desiring to be more educated space. And Lindsay, I think that's a perfect segue into talking about um, the follow-up will be that we'll prepare some resources that we'll be able to share, um, which will include um, the blog that you worked on, Lindsay, and some of the other resources that this very, very smart panel has collected and shared and some of the resources that we've collected at Ask as well um, to be able to um, help give some tools for the toolbox to have some of these conversations with children and to just um, be aware of some of the strategies and options families have as they're thinking about how to have some of these conversations um, with children. And um, I think that brings us to the conclusion of this discussion. And I want to thank you all again for your vulnerability and your openness and your honesty and your willingness to be a part of this and work through the technical issues and all the things that go along with trying to figure out how to do these virtual conversations. And um, I wanna make sure that if there's any questions that people have posted as part of the event that we have a chance to um, look at those together, kind of think about those together. And a lot of the comments I'm seeing are um, things like diversity makes us smarter um, and that um, the concerns and fears about facing re uh, racism has been really, re really real. Uh, and someone had shared that they um, fear every evening when their son, who is an essential worker, returns home late at night and they live in a border town of a native reservation. And, you know, some of the complexities that live that go along with living in some of those communities in Arizona in particular with the number of tribes that we have. Um, so there aren't any questions that I think that we need to respond to, but I just wanted to make sure if there's any parting thoughts, closing thoughts, final ideas, anybody wants to share, you have a chance to do so. Mona, I I, I think my last words, you know, this week we celebrated the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I think, you know, in so many ways uh, at the time of, of his death, he was one of the most hated men in America. And that was because of the work that he was doing around civil rights. And I think it's important to underscore that the discomfort in this 
is the only way that we'll change this. And I wanna, for me, my closing will be a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So for those who um, can hear these stories and know this reality exists and stay silent, I think that is what we, that's what stands out to me the most. We need everyone to use their voice in whatever circle it is, whether it's within their home, within their community, within their jobs, within their schools, because that's the only way that this will change. Well said, Aaliyah and Dr. King. Well, it's hard to follow Dr. King and Aaliyah, but I think um, one of the things that I wanted to share is look at all of the different uh, things that are on the news. We look at pictures, um, and I think that's one way I really think about talking about race is what's happening. So you could see, you know, people who are protesting or when people are at the Capitol versus people at a Black Lives Matter and you see all these guys that are in armor and, you know, ready to go. And it's just those, those you know, uh, if you look at the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, how people were treated there, those are specific um, examples of racism. And sometimes we just want to say, oh, no, there's not an issue there, but there really is. And so I think it's just really important um, to be okay with being uncomfortable, be okay with saying, I don't understand this. Can you help me to learn? And then the other thing is just really, um, yeah, just have, having those conversations um, with our kids um, because, you know, our kids will be, you know, hopefully in better places than we, we are. And as Leah said, you know, not have to have these conversations later on down the road. Yeah, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head about the being comfortable with being uncomfortable and that it's this is not a place anybody wants to be in, but it's a place that we have to be in. And to to just acknowledge that it's going to be hard and it's going to be uncomfortable, but to still be willing to have those conversations, I think is a message that I can take away from this conversation tonight is that that's really key. Mo Mona, I'm sorry, I, I was going to just say one more thing mm -hmm. is, you know, yesterday, um, our president, you know, said, talked about white supremacy and systematic racism and the needs to address it. And so I think, you know, well, what is systematic racism and what can we do to learn more about it to really understand it? And I also think about a colleague recently, I was telling her um, that when, they, when we had the presidential election, um, you know, Native Americans were classified as something else. What does that mean? You know, that's an, another example of systematic racism. So it's there, but it's just, are we willing to see it? Or do we want to see it? Excellent point. Excellent point. Final thoughts from anybody else? Okay. I just oh, wanted oh, to go ahead, mention, Jorge. I just wanted to mention that yesterday when I was, um, watching the news and I was sitting down with my daughter, my seven year old, and she was talking about, you know, the fact that the vice president is a, is a female. I think it raised a lot of hope, a lot of dreams. You know, she asked me, would I be able to be a, to be a vice president? Would I be able to have, um, you know, a position like that in the government one day. And I think yesterday it was really emotional for a lot of different races because there was a lot of uh, people that for the first time have positions so highly in the government that a lot of people never imagined. We have uh, Latin, um, Latinos that were there, the fact that, you know, there was so much diversity. I think it gives us hope. I think it's going to give us a lot of healing because we are in a healing process at this point. And I think it's important that we're open, that everyone is open to the, the, the diversity. I totally agree. And we are going into the next four years with the most diverse cabinet we have ever had in the federal government. And I think that speaks volumes. And Jorge, I will vote for your daughter when she runs for vice president. 
Thank you again for your time tonight. I really, really, really appreciate it. And for those of you that watched, thank you for your time and your patience as we started a little bit late and be on the lookout for some um, resources and we'll share the bio information and some of the resources that we talked about today out with the um, social media information that we do as a follow-up. But thank you again for everything tonight. I think the conversation was um, important and really helpful for a lot of families as they navigate um, how to have some of these tough conversations. Thank you all so much.